YouTube. Hello, 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 folks. Oh, man. What a day. <clears throat> Alright, let me make sure the uh, mic's decent here. How we all doing? I'm going to give the usual, let some folks have some time to get in here. Uh, I am totally going to miss my club meeting this this night, but, you know, that's the thing. Ah, <laughs> oh, man. I'm, I'm anticipating we'll have a lot less people as we're starting to get really good weather again. So I imagine the summer weather will strike and people will be off work and be like, live stream, nah, man. Nice weather. Because <laughs> if it's starting to get nice in Seattle, it's probably getting nice all over the place. Let's go, champ. Good to see you, Mega Machamp. <laughs> oh, Lord. All right. Uh, let's see. Do we have any interesting updates before we get on topic? Tonight's topic's a little philosophical. Think about that for a second. I don't think I have anything too interesting. Oh, uh, okay. So, I'm I'm going to be testing some lighting that is very economically friendly, but um, it'll. <laughs> It's way different than you probably expect. Uh, so no, not not the co-op light or anything like that. But um, yeah, some some lighting I'm gonna test, and um, I may or may not actually be working directly with someone to adapt that lighting or adjust that lighting to be suited for aquarium use compared to what it currently is built for i need to uh do some interesting stuff <laughs> to test it first but we'll see uh and make up a champ i'll answer that question right now um i need to get in contact with jason because jason at redfish bluefish hasn't directly uh contacted me <laughs> Greg, uh, Greg, I doubt you are using economically friendly lighting. <laughs> anyway, um, I have to, I have to get in touch with uh, with Jason just to see if he needs more fish. I am uh, relatively soon. Put that in big quotation marks. Uh, at two different people that I'm doing tours with soon, uh, and they're they're both like on vacation right now. So once they come back, they're both supposed to get in touch with me. And then from there, I'm going to schedule some stuff. And one will take me out to um, Will, which is Northwest Aqua Hobby, to check out his, like, Immerse Grow farm and, and talk a little bit about his story uh, and what he's doing. And while I'm out there, right, it would only make sense to take fish out to Jason. I just have to talk to him and see that, uh, he's got tank space and I'm in his plans to bring him more fish. That's all it comes to. We've both been kind of busy. Uh, so I haven't talked to him in several months. Uh, it's been since basically the winter. So, you know, I like, like, I think we talked last in December. So it's, it's legitimately been five months, but at the time I was like ultra busy. Uh, and there was no way I was making it out that way. Where now my schedule has changed. So, it's a little bit, a little bit interesting. Oh, it's a heroes, geez. Uh, okay, so that's on that. But yeah, I'm I'm testing some lighting that is interesting. It's very powerful. It's not very expensive, but it also doesn't have a lot of features. It's basically just on off. Uh, so I'm gonna do some testing with it, and then the person who builds those things uh, has indicated to me that we can make some adjustments based on some feedback. So I'm I'm sending some initial information that person's way and I'm going to see if there's a way to build a like super economically friendly 
aquarium light that we can distribute inside the U.S. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we'll see if it if it meets the muster. The, my my fear is it's actually too powerful, and most people won't have need for that strong a light because it is very very bright, um, and it's dirt cheap compared to most other lights. We'll put it that way for their power. Anyway, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what's going on. Uh, I'll, I gotta do some tests first, and then from there I'll see what uh, what we can see. Big Tank Hank, good to see you, buddy. Uh, okay, uh, Bob Purcell, let me answer that question, then I'll get into my topic about algae. Uh, will you be working on Wabin Moosters now that your schedule has changed? Not exactly right away. So the big problem that I've had with my Wabin Moosters is that my reliable male and female that breed pretty frequently, he always kicks the eggs out. And I'm very low on space right now for raising up babies safely. So um, my goal is basically to get some things in place to make it, f to facilitate basically getting my garage going. Uh, and then once that's done, then I'll have space, right? The space, power, and all those kind of things. Uh, and the Wabin Moosters will get bred. So I have backup pairs that are now basically sexually mature, but I've kept the males and the females separate. Um, so some ones that I got from uh, Marcel W., which is Roseline17 on Aquabid, uh, out of his genetics. So I have some extra, some fish. I've got plenty of life in them. They're all doing very, very well, fat, happy, all those kind of good things. Um, it's just a matter of basically for now, I'm going to make sure that everything is in good shape so that when I get my garage going, I can actively breed. I'm getting some, this isn't official yet, but I have been in the talk with someone, um, to, who is kind of a pleco aficionado expert, hobbyists, kind of all those mixed together to, uh, to basically give me some coaching, give me some help to be more effective, uh, and, and may or may not kind of act as that person's backup space too. We'll see. Depends on how that person uh, takes takes our initial conversation. No pressure to that person if they watch this later. Uh, and to the fellow GSS member who asked, uh, no, I'm not going to this week's meeting because it's just a home show. And I had a, I've got a bunch of medical stuff for my lady. I'm trying to shift some stuff in my schedule around to make it uh, for when the talks come, I'll go to the talks. But for the home show, I'll just rewatch the 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 home show. I, I don't have any like pressing needs for that one. I know, I know. Okay, so let's get on topic for a sec. Let's talk algae. Okay. Algae for a lot of people, and this is, I'll go based off just the emails that I receive. Algae can be very, very difficult to, to defeat. And I get algae in my tanks all the time. Uh, you know, mostly glass and dust algaes. And I think that those are a positive sign. I'm going to be very clear. I think a lot of algae, and I mean a lot as in types, not necessarily as in like my, my tank is just riddled with algae, okay? I think those are good signs of healthy systems. But algae can be very difficult for us to get rid of and for us to beat. It often takes a lot of time. And I think personally that that is a good thing. And let me explain why. Because algae, when you, when you have a really bad algae outbreak, it's usually a very slow process to get it under control. And why that's a good thing is it allows us as hobbyists to very slowly make adjustments. And as we as we tweak all these little things, with the amount of food, the amount of light, how we're doing our nutrients, uh, maybe our water change schedule, whatever it may be that we're going to make adjustments to, what we're doing 
kind of in the background, whether we realize it or not, is trying to understand what went out of balance in our tank. Right? We are using this period of time to figure out what went wrong and to fix that problem. Long term, what I think this does is every time we deal with some different kind of algae outbreak, it teaches us about the imbalances within our aquariums so that long term we can create healthier, more balanced systems. Learning from failures is, is a big thing for me. I think that every time we have something go wrong, it's a great opportunity to learn something rather than looking at it like, oh no, how do I fix this? It's okay. How do I fix this? And more importantly, how do I make sure that I don't engage and have this issue happen in the future? Now, sometimes you'll get really small amounts of algae, right? A little dust algae on your, your hardscape or on your glass. It's easy to clean up or maybe even like the look of it on your wood or your rock. I usually do, actually. Small amounts are very good, right? This is just a part of the ecosystem. And having little bits of algae here and there are good for a number of the fish species that most of us keep in our planet aquariums. Any of your um, auto sinkless, your hillstream loach varieties, your plecos, all those, they're going to slowly but surely graze on some amount of that. But where we run into problems are usually things like blackbeard algaes and hair algaes. And then, of course, uh, although they call it an algae, uh, the blue green algae, that's cyanobacteria, right? It's actually a bacteria, not necessarily an algae. But <clears throat> those are the things that we look at a lot more negatively. But I think those are the biggest opportunity to learn. Now, the opposite side of this, right, is that very often the biggest algae issues tend to happen for our newer aquarists right we usually run into the biggest algae problems when we're new to the hobby or maybe we're coming back to the hobby after not having done it for several years and that's when you can get these things can be very frustrating right because you, you have in your mind i'm going to have this beautiful planted tank or i'm going to have this this amazing rockscape or i'm going to do whatever you're doing right i'm going to have my pineapple hut my broken pirate ship my big bad mean cichlid running around <laughs> you know whatever Whatever is your fancy, right? That's what you're shooting for. And then all of a sudden, I've got algae everywhere. It looks horrible. I can't see my pirate ship anymore. It, I wouldn't mind if it looked like a flag coming off of it, but it looks like the entire ship is covered. This is terrible. Or like, I'm worried about my plants. There's so much algae. I don't know that they're getting what they need. and They might get choked out. Whatever that might be, right? Those kind of things can be a headache, and sometimes if people don't get the right advice or maybe they they just struggle to get things under control or they take too like nuclear an option because somebody gives them bad advice, it can get people to not want to continue in the hobby. So what do we do? When we encounter these big algae issues, what do we do? The first thing we need to look at is what has changed? Did we add more fish? Did we have some, some fish move from our tank to a different tank, but we kept feeding the same amount? Um, did we do a big trim of our plants, and now we've got, like, way less plant matter in the tank than we did a couple weeks ago, but we're still putting in the same amount of fertilizer? Or maybe, like, all my plants look kind of, eh. They're not growing very lush, and... I've been using the same amount of fertilizer for the last six months. I don't understand. It's My plants are growing tall, but they look all kind of thin and lanky, right? These are We have to look at these things because each of these is a different little symptom that tells us, if not the entirety of the problem, a piece of the puzzle, 
right? We're we're playing we're playing puzzle games here. We got to find clues. We're we're turning into a sleuth. It is time to put on your your inspector gadget and and get to work, right? So if we've got less fish, or maybe we changed foods, the first thing we need to do is uh, pay attention to what we're feeding and how much we're feeding, and maybe make an adjustment there. Do we buy a brand new light? I got rid of that that cheapo beams work. I got me a nice Fluval Planet 3.0. I copied Bentley's light setting from his 40 gallon breeder and I put it right on my 20 gallon long. I don't understand why I've got so much algae. Right? Things like this. We have to look at the changes. Now let's say that we, we think that we haven't done any changes. Now we need to start looking at the plants, right? Are, do our plants look kind of thin and leggy? Are we seeing, like, not so good color? Then more than likely what we're looking at is some kind of nutrient deficiency. We don't have enough nutrients coming into the water for the amount of plants that are in the tank anymore. Maybe the plants have grown in more. They're way more dense. But we never increased the amount of fertilizer to account for all that extra plant matter. And now some of the lower growth in our stems is dying off. And that's actually causing some extra breakdown material that's adding extra bio load and that algae is getting to feed off of that you got all these different things right these are all little symptoms we need to look at for me personally whenever i have an algae outbreak first thing i do is i think back over the last month what have i changed and if my answer is nothing then i look immediately at my plants and i look at my substrate because if i see way too much mulm on my substrate I've probably got a lot of extra breakdown waste material in there that I need to take care of, and that's what the algae is feeding off of. There's lots of little things that we can look at, and this is where we get to teach ourselves the most is by looking and identifying these things and then slowly making adjustments to see if we see improvement as we make those adjustments. Because if we see signs of improvement, that means we're on the right track. If we don't see signs of improvement, now granted, this is usually over a week or two, two weeks preferable. My personal, it's a slow, slow process of fighting algae correctly, right? Building a balance takes time. This isn't something you do, you pour in like two drops of liquid X and three drops of liquid Y and wait an hour and it's just done. Time, patience, these are the things that help you. Okay? That's my, my kind of philosophical talk for tonight. I wanted to keep it a little short, a little simple, but um, I personally look at algae as a positive thing, as long as it is in reasonable amounts. Like a little bit of algae on the glass, that never bothers me. A little bit of algae on my hardscape never bothers me. Tons and tons and tons of like hair algae or black brush algae, now that's a different problem. That's something that needs to be addressed. So I will go through chat and I will answer some questions. Again, if you the usual at Bentley Pasco makes it super easy for me to see your questions and we'll go through and finish out the rest of the night. Just QA, nice and easy peasy. Let us see here. Uh, I need to scroll back to shortly before. There we go. Alice B. This is the first question I saw that I, I didn't answer, but I want to answer. Uh, how can I keep eggs from fungusing? My Corey's like eggs in my community tank, and I'd like to pull them. So, Alice, um, one of the things that most, many, some, I, I will go, the, the really successful breeders that I know best, what they tend to do is they will remove those eggs and put them in their own, um, usually like a breeder box or a container while they remain eggs, something that is a different system. Now, I like using just specimen containers so you can keep them inside the tank to keep them at the same temperature okay you just fill them with water but you don't have them share water right put a little air stone in there real gentle you just want a little bit of movement tiny 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 amount of movement a little bit of air bubbling just to keep it oxygenated and then usually what you want to do is you either want to have like a single drop of methylene blue or, my personal preference, because it's a little easier to find, go get a thing at Ickex, because Ickex has methylene blue and a little bit of something else, and put a single drop 
in a small specimen container, even a large, you really don't need much. A single drop should be enough, but if you still see issues, go to two drops. Just use a little cheap pipette or a syringe, something where you can easily see even drops right into there. That is enough to prevent them from fungusing, but also not causing issues in the eggs. Now, the other way that we can usually do to keep eggs safe is just to have them in a tumbler. If you don't want to use any kind of chemical, maybe you're worried that uh, your particular quarries might be sensitive to that chemical when they hatch. Uh, and, and you have to, when they hatch, you have to move them pretty quickly, like, quickly, like with the same day out of that kind of solution. Because you just don't want them dealing with that the whole time. Okay. The, the opposite end is you get a tumbler and you set it real gentle just so you see the eggs moving. Plecos and a lot of other fish, the way that they protect their eggs, and normally they're in stream systems, so this helps them naturally, but they sit there and they move water around, like Plecos fan, right? That's what they call it. They're basically just pushing fresh water around to prevent anything from sitting long enough to cause fungus to appear. Now keep in mind... If your eggs are going white, it might not be fungus. It could be unfertilized eggs. But if you're seeing some kind of like fuzziness or anything like that, that's fungus of some form. Those are the two ways that I would look at doing it. It depends on how tough your eggs are when it comes to tumbling. Most Corydoras can do it pretty well. But again, as they start hatching, you need to stop the tumble and move them to some other safe place to start finishing their hatch and raising up. Right? Um, you know, Master Breeder Dean, for example, he uses Methylene Blue. I know a few people that use Ickex. I've tested Ickex personally to prevent it on rainbow fish eggs, which rainbow fish eggs are notorious for fungusing very, very easily. Um, so those, those would be the options I would look at. Rainbow fish can't handle a tumbler, otherwise I'd try to use tumblers. They're just way, they're too gentle, too gentle of children. <laughs> <laughs> They're such fragile beings for their first, like, two weeks of life. Uh, Jacob Hill, I just went to a really nice store called Planted Aquaria, and I got an Anubius that was already flowering. Will the flower stay? Uh, their water is pretty much the same as mine. So it will stay for a period of time, but eventually it does, you know, go away. I would expect it, depending on how long it's been there, to stay for at least a week. Most of the Anubius flowers tend to stay for about... Mm, two weeks depending on the species some of them will only stay for about a week so you know depends on how long that flower has been there it could stay for a few more days could stay for a week might just be really robust and stay longer it depends on how happy and healthy that plant is and how well it takes the adjustment going from where it was to where you're putting it a little sip of water for my cup I've been using. <laughs> uh, Crib Keeper Aquatics, a healthy black beer carpet looks incredible. Really want to get another one going soon. You know, actually, my, my significant other wants to do a black beard algae scape. That's what she wants. And I, I may or may not have been kind of intentionally growing black beard algae in a tank to seed a tank for her that we have that I need to get set up and running <laughs> yeah gonna have a blackbeard algae tank with i think probably coolie loaches for her because she really wants coolie loaches so that should be interesting right <laughs> uh and i do i switched my aquarium to slow moving plenum six months ago uh no joke the tank is so much less maintenance and algae i haven't lost a single fish due to disease awesome i'm, I'm glad you have it working correctly I don't have any personal experience with Putnam, so it's hard for me to do anything other than say, glad to hear stories like yours. I've also heard stories that are like, not not very frequently, but I've heard some nightmare stories too. It's kind of like with a, a dirty tank, right? You're going to have 30 people that have really great experiences, and you're going to have that one person who's like, here's my nightmare. And that's, that's about what I've seen for the people that have asked me about Putnam's. But I haven't experienced anything myself personally yet. I will test it eventually. Looking forward to it. Because, hey, if it works great, I'm totally not opposed to like changing a ton of tanks out and, and building them into a bunch of tanks. I like things that work. I really do. 
do 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 do. All right. Ah, oh, Chad jumped on me like crazy. There we go. Caught back up. Uh, Mark, what's a good fertilizer that doesn't have lots of nitrates? My tank runs 20 to 40 already. Uh, my my first suggestion right away would be Brightwell's Florin Multi. So Florin Multi is all of your micros plus potassium, and that's it. So there's uh, you're not going to deal with phosphate, nitrates. Um, that makes it pretty easy. You're going to get your phosphates and your nitrates from your water and your natural, your feeding, your fish. Should be simple and easy for people that naturally have kind of high nitrates in their water already. That is usually what I suggest. Just make sure that you're doing reasonable water changes to keep your nitrates in the system. Otherwise, you'll have no nitrates whatsoever, and eventually the plants will suffer. Because over time, they'll just consume so much that your fish load probably won't keep up. Do, 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 do. Zen Ginger. My daughter wants bettas. Some little fish to go with them. I was thinking maybe pseudos. Thoughts, do they go with bettas? Are they easy for kids? If so, which one? So my first concern is that they like to be top water and they're kind of jumpy and bettas. Sometimes they seem like a predator when they're just swimming around to little fish, even if they're very docile bettas. So make sure you have a lid so that you don't have fish jumping out. Otherwise, I think pseudos are good. Uh, my pseudo of choice would either be the Luminatus or the Furcata, which is the Forktail Rainbow. Those are the two I would go through. I would avoid thread fins. Um, just because that's an opportunity for a, a betta to maybe bully when it otherwise would be a very peaceful fish. Uh, but your your smaller finned pseudomagills are great options, and those two are the e some of the easiest to get uh, when it comes to just going to a random store. So that would be that'd be the option I would go with. Granted, they're not necessarily an easy fish. If you're trying to like breed them, but if you're just trying to keep them, yeah, they're super easy. They just need small kind of powdery food because they have smaller mouths. So like flake food works best, um, you know, like extreme krill or community tetra color even like there's lots of options that work great. Uh, Jay Partridge from your plant health video. I noticed my plants were deficient in iron and I started getting algae. I noticed three types of iron, EDTA, DTPA, and ferrous gluconate. Which one? Uh, really? Okay, here's the thing. It kind of doesn't matter which of the three as long as whatever iron source being used is chelated. So in general, most of the good liquid fertilizer manufacturers and some of the powdered fert manufacturers out there are using some form of chelated iron. And all that means is it's easy for the plants to uptake. So, like, don't go putting rusty nails in your tank to, like, get iron in there. You can use things like Mexican potting clay down in your substrate to act as a natural iron source at the roots, and a lot of your plants will just feed off of that over time naturally. Uh, and you just you have it on fire, and you just create, like, little discs and literally plug it into your substrate. You can do the same thing uh, with, like, laterite-based substrates, too. You can just add a little laterite. It'll act as an iron source. It's easiest, honestly, just to get a liquid fertilizer and add that in. So, like, your Easy Irons or, you know, <laughs> Brightwell has an iron supplement. Even Flourish, I, as much as I, like, chagrin about Flourish, it's because of Flourish's, like, entire design range. But when you're using an individual supplement, it's actually fine. Uh, so if you're getting, like, just the iron or you maybe need just the potassium, Flourish is just fine. So that, that should give you lots of options, JD. I hope that helps. Do 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 do. Do 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 do. Uh, follow from Alice. How long roughly will it take to hatch? I'm completely unsure. I'm not a big Corridor breeder, so best person to ask if I were you, I would go talk to Tom over at TM Aquatics. That guy is a Cory breeding machine. He knows a ton about Corridoras. He's a he's a, like a Corridora super nerd. He will be super helpful. He's a super nice guy, breeds tons of them. Uh, I'm pretty confident he's bred stir by like a million billion times. Or if you're a, if you're a member at the co-op, go into one of the member streams and ask that question. Corey will answer it. He's bred stir by tons of times. I'm like, I just like Corys and keep them, but I haven't actively tried to breed them yet. In the garage, we're breeding some Corys. I got some uh, some Equus like calling my name. 
Do do do. Uh, let's see here. Oh, there you go. Stop talking too much. Chat's jumping like crazy tonight. That's how you know I'm way behind. If I do miss your your question, folks, feel free to just re-ask it in chat. I will do my best. Make sure you at Bentley Pasco. More likely to see it that way. The usual YouTube thingies, right? <laughs> uh, moniker. I always add the A unintentionally, but Monik Revish. There we go. I'm dealing with green fur algae on my hardscape. Checked phosphates, and they were really high. Added CK came Fosgard, and now they are down to 0 0.05. Any other cause for that algae? Thank you. Uh, you know, so I think I know the type, you're ty the type you're talking about, where it looks almost like grass, like like a fu little fuzzy lawn, or like a you know those fuzzy blankets, right? It has that kind of appearance to it. Uh, that stuff, honestly, I love that stuff because it looks amazing in, in aquascapes when it's on, like, your wood or hardscape. It looks incredible. Uh, it looks really, really natural. But for those who want to get rid of it, most commonly when I've seen that kind of algae, it's, yeah, some kind of excessive phosphate. I've been feeding way too heavy. You know, I'm just going, like, hog wild on the food and not paying attention and realizing, like, oh, this tank that I moved a bunch of fish out of, I'm still feeding, like, I've got three times the number of fish in there. You know, being a dum-dum. Uh, so... That'd be the first thing I'd look at. If you're especially if your phosphates are elevated, most likely it's overfeeding a little too much. We're getting some stuff. You could go down into your, your substrate and try and gravel back a little bit, try and get some of the extra mulm and stuff that's down in there, all those uh, you know, breaking down substances that are adding different random things to your water column. Help kind of clean that up a little bit. Should help. Uh, Naidu, will overdosing fertilizers like Brightwell's Florin Multi cause algae since it doesn't contain phosphorus slash nitrate? So, it can. Here's the thing. Algae is a single cell organism. It only needs one thing that it can feed off, basically to tune itself to, in excess and just zero in on it and go great. I'm getting, I'm getting yelled at by Kelly Foreman <laughs> for my pronunciation. Listen, I'm going to say it how I want. Chelated just sounds weird. No, you, you, I assume you're correct. I don't know. I, I haven't cared that much, but I appreciate the correction. <laughs> uh, anyway, back on, to, back on topic. I'm sorry. I'm laughing at myself for being a dumb dumb. Um, so it can, but it's less likely to occur because it's not a macro, and the macros are the ones that are the easiest for most of those algae to feed on and flourish from. The only other thing that uh, algae is really good at dealing with in excess, as far as quick outbreaks, is going to be iron. Micros, it tends to not happen as much, but you also don't need very much of those micros at all, so you don't have to like go hog wild with them. Floor and multi literally can be dosed, uh, like, by drops and be effective. It's it's kind of interesting. Let's see you have a really big system. Paul Soltero. The only tanks I have issue with hair algae are the shallow 20 longs. I shorten the time the lights are on and reduce the intensity when they're on for the JCMP. So far, so good. Yeah, the biggest thing is just because they're so shallow, right, it's really easy to, like, push way more light than we think we're doing. And you can, you can be like me and be so used to a 40 breeder that you dial in all your stuff for a 40 breeder. And then you realize you put those dialed in ridiculous light levels on like a 15 gallon or a 20 long. And you're like, oh, that tank's way shallower than what I'm used to. I am pumping way too much light on this thing. <laughs> and usually you dial the light back a little bit and it fixes the problem. I prefer dimming over losing time, but I'm a psycho and run my lights like way longer than most people ever should. Dial it back. Makes it easy. Makes it easy. Removing my pedantic pants now. <laughs> uh, we'll see which of your presets did you recommend on a planted 2.0 light? Well, none of them. because Okay, 3.0. <laughs> so it depends on the height of the tank. Uh, I have... I like my... My personal favorite is what I call my day sim. So I use the regular day sim on anything that's like a 40 breeder or taller. Keep that in mind. That means that it has to be fairly heavily planted. For most people, 
I would generally suggest reducing the overall time in which that light runs. I think my presets run for like 12 or 13 hours. I, I haven't looked at it in so long, I forget exactly how long. I would reduce that down to a total run time of eight hours. And you can just slowly shave down the time everywhere evenly to get down that time, right? Makes it a lot easier. I put more light because that's what I'm accustomed to, so I do things based on what I have the most experience with. And I am a psycho <laughs> and give my plants a lot of light. If your tank is shallower than that, something like a 20 long, uh, even a 29 gallon potentially, 10 gallon, 15 gallon, 30 breeders, any of those slightly shallower tanks, anything that basically isn't about 18 inches tall, then that's where I would use the shallow day soon. Okay? Uh, those are both present in my Ultimate Guide to the Flu Ball Planted 3.0 Part 3 video, the pro mode video. Now, if you really want to go easy, uh, I have an automatic setting that I also have recommended in both a shallow and regular version. I would use that. A lot easier to program, a lot simpler to like shave the time down on, makes it super easy. Super, super easy. I actually suggest most people use auto mode because it's just less intensive. Uh, I'm I'm a crazy when it comes to doing my pro mode stuff because I'm trying to like simulate a slightly more natural day cycle, and I've had a lot of success with it. So I just that's what I go to. I've had so much success with that particular setting, uh, and a very similar one on the Aqua Sky. Do, 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 do. Chad jumped. That's why you know I'm behind. Uh, Carissa, Bentley, thoughts on using Pandagara as an algae eater in a 20 gallon? Currently stocked with CPDs, autos, planet tank, dealing with hair algae. So, in my personal experience, when I kept a lot of Pandagara, they did not eat hair algae or blackbeard algae. They're really good at surface algae, and as they get bigger, they can get a little bullyish. Like, they'll bully, especially other Pandagaras around. They kind of fight a lot. Um, so I'm not really big on them as an algae eater. However, I've heard tons of stories from people in the Midwest that they're fantastic at eating blackbeard algae and hair algae. So maybe that's just a matter of mine were lazy or I was feeding enough to where they didn't need to feed on that algae. They were getting plenty of food, so they just ignored those things. Be my thing. Kelly Foreman is now putting her pedantic pats back on. <laughs> I had Jay Partridge like, I'm a chemist. I know what you were saying about chelated. <laughs> uh, Brad Smith Studios, what is the best way to test for iron? There is, so, I mean, it, the best way would be using a photospectrometer kit, but that's many hundred dollars. So you can get um, iron-specific tests that are out there. It's harder to find them from API. Um, there's a European company that makes one. One sec, one sec. I gotta, I gotta go and uh, abuse my current employer's website. So you can, you can test it. Um, there's there's all sorts of drinking water test kits out there that are strips that will give you some kind of amount. Uh, but you're gonna have to play like kind of a translational game because they're not gonna tell you in the way that most things do. Seachem has a, a multi test kit for iron, uh, and there is something in. One, I swear API had an iron test specifically at one point, but maybe that's not the case. It's probably the European company I'm thinking of, and I can't remember their name. Their name is like just three letters, and it's my brain is out the window. I had a ton of training today. Many, many, many hours of training. But yeah, uh, if you want, actually, I'll give you, I'll give you a direct link to the Seachem one. Just in case, this is Seachem's iron test kit. 
and uh, for for the Federal Trade Commission as an Amazon affiliate. If you make a purchase using a link that I've given you, I will receive a small commission to my YouTube channel. So please know that that is a paid link. Thank you. Please don't sue me or find me. FTC, I can't afford it because <laughs> it's a ludicrous fine. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. Hope that helps. Uh, ooh, snap. <laughs> I just purchased Fork Tail Rainbow Fish. Do you have any insight on this type of rainbow? These are the first time keeping them. So all, all the pseudomagills are pretty much the same. They are relatively tolerant of a lot of water conditions. I would stay, try to stay semi-neutral. Somewhere between like 6.8 and about 7.4 pH is helpful. Uh, they don't like ultra hard water, but they can handle it. If you're trying to breed them specifically, they don't throw a lot of eggs per day, but they will spawn daily. And other than that, just a good, reasonable protein food. Uh, you know, something that's like 50% protein or so. Make sure there's a little bit of veg matter in there. That's why I like say something like the Extreme Community, where it's a mix of spirulina and krill. Uh, anything similar to that doesn't have to be exactly that food. They love, 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 love live foods like Daphnia, um, baby brine shrimp, and frozen food too. So, like, my personal favorite is frozen cyclops, if you can get them. Daphnia is fantastic. Baby brine, also fantastic. Any of those small kind of micro crustaceans, those are all fantastic. They are great as, like, a, at least once a week kind of food. Jeff Kosky, my baby rainbow fish is about one and a quarter inches now. I think I have four generations of baby Julii cats now, four different sizes, probably have near 40 quarries. Nice. Uh, Jacob Hill Bentley, what is your most used type of filter in all of your tanks? That's a good question. The thing is, like, I've tried a lot of different stuff, and they're all in all sorts of different tanks because of various testing. I mean, probably technically a sponge. Because I have, like, sponge pre-filters on a bunch of my canisters, or not canisters, but on my hang-on backs. And then I have sponges in more tanks than I probably do anything else. Other than that, I think it's, like, a kind of a tie between AquaClears and Tidals. Uh, I might have slightly more titles now than AquaClears because I had one uh, AquaClear motor burn out on me and I replaced it with a title, and that uh, I think it sways it towards, like, one more tank than 50-50. <sighs> but, yeah, I, it, I use a lot of different stuff. I have all sorts of different stuff that I've picked up over time throughout my fish room. Like, when it comes to big filters, I love the FX6. I love the thing to death. Um, I'm, I both like and dislike the Oase. I like it because it's very fast maintenance as long as you keep on top of it. I hate it because I often find myself busy and get behind and then don't service it often enough. Then I lose a lot of flow, and then I've realized, like, I've lost a lot of flow, and now I need to go with speed cleaning out in the middle of the night. <laughs> so I have, I have something like that happens. So I, I just get too wrapped up in all the different things I have going on in my life that, uh, yeah. Uh, Crypt Keeper Aquatics. If you were setting up a dozen 10-gallon tanks scattered around the house, what lights would you go with? Can you put them next to each other and run long lights for cheaper? Or cannot, I'm assuming. Can't. Yeah, can't put them next to each other. All over your house, huh? It depends on what you're trying to do. If your goal is to, like, have nicely planted tanks that look really, really immaculate then I think either the JCMP clip-on is really good, and there's several lights that are exactly the same as that JCMP clip-on. That's just the one that I have the most experience with. Or the Fluval 3.0 Nano. Those would be my two. One is significantly cheaper. Sorry, big sneeze there. Hope I muted it in time. I don't want to like, blow people's ears out. Um, but yeah, the JCMP is significantly cheaper. Uh, or like, I think Hyger makes the almost the exact same thing. Uh, and there's probably another company. But I, I generally like the color spectrum and controllability as far as how much you can dim it down if you're going too bright. Uh, that clip-on's pretty good. I have it on a 15-gallon in Brother-in-Law James's tank. For a long time, I was testing it here in my Fluo Flex. Um, it's a pretty good little light and not terribly expensive if you want something a little bit nicer but it's going to cost you a little bit more money uh then you know it, it's all about your budget right if you're trying to go ultra cheap 
You could even do some small, like, shop-style lights. Um, there's... You could get, like, a, a, a kind of gooseneck-style pendant lamp over the top, right? And, and use... Uh, there's, like, a $15 bulb that you can put in that's pretty good. Uh, I think even, like, Kevin Novak's talked about a bulb that's, like, kind of mimics what a Kessel does. So there's a lot of options out there. It's kind of just personal taste and what your budget is. And if you're trying to go, like, just enough light for the fish, or you're trying to go, like, super planted tank and it looks all incredible everywhere, right? They're, they're very different depending on what you're trying to do with the tank. And yeah, in general, uh, Jacob Hill's mentioning JCMPs or, or Nycruz. Um, yeah, I think they're they're so similar. I personally like the the the, the JCMP and or there's another light. So there's someone else who makes the same has the same light. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I, I just like the color spectrum on it. It just looks nicer to my eyes. But that's totally 100% personal taste. Uh, Zen Ginger. If I'm trying to attach plants, Hygrophila pinnatifida, tissue culture, to driftwood, tree, are there any conditions, light, ferns, etc., to encourage them to root and attach faster? Uh, you will want... The easiest way is to get, like, Flourish Advance, but you could also do this with um, Brightwell Floor and Multi. Basically, there are certain micronutrients that are really, really important to root growth, and you want to make sure there is lots of that available for that particular plant. And then give it good light, medium or higher, and it'll be happy. And a little bit of CO2 goes a long way with that particular plant, but not necessarily required. Hope that helps, Zen Ginger. Yeah, cheese ball, easy green has the micro and macronutrients that plants crave. But it's not Brondo, man. Brondo has what plants crave. <laughs> With its easy-to-use pump head. Man, you're trying to make a commercial in my chat? Are you, like, secretly Randy? <laughs> I know. I, I mean, obviously, like, I have Easy Green behind me. I use Easy Green a lot. My only qualm lately, and I, I need to, like... I probably need to send an email to Candy so that she'll send it off to, to Corey. My only qualm lately is in the, small, the newer pump bottles. The pump head like sticks a lot easier than this style pump head now granted they have to send out a smaller dose of fertilizer so it's a different pump head but i've noticed that in all my like small bottles before they move to the big bottle and even the big bottle that pump head gets kind of like locked up to where it's not doing a full pump anymore as reliably and i'm just doing these like teeny tiny little like quarter squirts of fertilizer so i have to like feel like i'm really overdosing my tank to get the same amount of fertilizer that's my only complaint it has nothing to do with the fertilizer itself it's all about the bottle it's on <laughs> and maybe that's just because of the uh the temperature in which i keep them in because Corey did mention that in a like recent member stream something about it it starts crystallizing at temperatures under like hot fish room temperature because <laughs> it's getting too cold Uh, there's one from Astrophotographer, and then chat jumped. No. Uh, do you have enough Kessel's A360X light will let you control the blue channel to help control algae? I believe it does. Um, if the A360 uh, is the app-controlled one, if not, then you have to get the external controller in order to control those things. But then once that you have that external controller, I believe it allows you to do so. I would ask Kessel directly, personally, if you can get an answer. I've tried, I've tried asking questions of Kessel many, many times, and um, I basically never get answers, and it's kind of annoying. Kind of annoying for how expensive their lights are. Forgive me. Seasonal weather change affects me something serious when it comes to my sinuses. I hate it. And I technically don't have allergies. Lizette. My 20-gallon one was doing great. Plants growing... Uh, Epiphytes recovered, but must email you with update because now I have BBA. Uh oh. Especially hate on the uh, Alternanthera Rhinechii and S. Repens. Yeah, those are two plants where, like, they, when they look incredible, you don't want to see anything go wrong. Then when something goes wrong, you're just like, mm, you, I lose. I had it. It looks so good. Why are you ruining this for me? 
But you can do it. You can do it. Paul Saltero's just telling me that Kelly is correct. Uh, that's probably right. Kelly's always right. <laughs> oh, fairly, fairly. Thanks for the super chat. I appreciate it. Totally not necessary, but I appreciate it. All right, let me jam in here. We got some more, some more questiones. Ian Firewater. Uh, greetings. I think I have to accept imperfection, fish loving life, when algae diminished, when plants struggling. So two out of three ain't bad. Uh, we can get the plants there. It's just it's still a patient game. The nice thing about plants is, for the most part, most of our plants are pretty durable and can take a while before they're like really gone, gone. So if they're just kind of struggling, we can we can make adjustments and slowly get them where we need them. It just depends on what kind of struggle we're seeing. Uh, Fish Tank Dad. Nike has a light that fits a 10-gallon for about 17 bucks. I have one on my beta tank, and it grows nice plants and looks good. There you go. Here's a great option to answer that previous question. Nike has a light for $17 reduce. It's a good option. Let's see. Can I find it? Can I find Nike's light? Uh, thank you. Nike LED Aquarium Lot. I need one that fits... Uh, I'm assuming you mean the clip-on light, Fish Tank Dad? And probably the 10.5-inch. The probably looking at this bad boy right here. This is the Nikrut light. Boom, 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 boom. For those who want a link to Amazon, again, I am an affiliate of Amazon. Please, FTC, don't find me if you make a purchase using my link. I do earn a small commission if it's a qualified purchase. Blah, 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 blah. I hate having to do that, but I literally have to do it every time. Or they can find me like $50,000. It's something ridiculous. It's like, dude, do you... product placement in movies isn't that strict. What the heck? <laughs> oh, lordy. Uh, very, very, speaking of, who gave us a super chat earlier, will peroxide as a spot treatment be okay a few days before adding a new beta? Yeah, so peroxide very, very quickly becomes uh, safe inside your aquarium. When hydrogen peroxide hits water, a natural chemical reaction occurs where it breaks down and splits apart. Instead of becoming H2O2, it becomes hydrogen gas and water. Or maybe it's hydrogen gas and oxygen, oxygen gas. I was never a chemistry major. I want to be very clear here. But it does break down very, very quickly and becomes safe very, very fast. So as long as you're doing it a couple days beforehand, you'll be A-OK. -okay. A-OK. -okay. Mr. Littles, don't forget to like. Thank you, Mr. Littles. You're the best. Uh, guys are better YouTubers than I am. <laughs> uh, Paul Saltero, SAEs and Nearite Snails will go to town on BBA. Yeah, Nearite Snails are like champions. So are SAEs. I personally like the reticulated SAE, as most people know. That's like my, my go-to algae eater. Uh, they cleaned up my outbreak in my discus tank, 120. It took them a couple of weeks to get rid of all of it. Yeah. If you're willing to put some uh, life in there to do the work, it tends to be the most effective. Aha, Google mandated name. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Bentley, I'm the guy you described with the new Fluval 3.0. I have very slow plant growth. Your Bentley's day profile on a 30 gal. I added tabs and easy green suggestions, cut the light. Yeah, I, all I would do is um, take take the overall. I, what I would actually do is I would shift to an automatic setting first uh, and, and let your tank kind of adjust to how powerful the Fluval is. And um, the... In my part two of the ultimate guide, there's a shallow version of my automated setting. Just use that thing. Start there. And then if it if you notice that like the plants look kind of leggy, then what I would do is dial up the light a little bit, take it up like an extra ten percent across everything but the blue, and and see how that adjusts over like a couple weeks. The good thing is we can do this like slowly and take our time and see how things adjust and, and accept our changes. That's the nice thing about most planet tanks. Master photographer, thank you for all you do for the hobby. I love your unbiased evaluation. Well, I have some bias. <laughs> I have some bias naturally. A member for 19 months, man. You mean you've been you've been in there for a while at Sudamigil level, no less. 
got the Wanamensis badge in there. Uh, I mean, <laughs> my bias is usually just that I want people to, like, have success, to be fair. And it's all based on my experience. That's the bigger thing. My my true bias is it's based on my experience. I'm not based on science. There's a little, little tidbits of science in there, but not, like, we're not talking somebody like freshwater ichthyology, right? Like, she is a proper scientist and ichthyologist <laughs> in, in studying, right? I'm I'm just some dope who loves this stuff, <laughs> but it's pretty good at figuring some some low level science out to understand why things do the things they do. So my bias is my experience. Everybody has some bias. It's just figuring out whether it's like I love Fluval products and totally not because they provide them to me versus like. Hey, I like Fluval because all of these things work really well, but I don't really like this one over here, you know. <laughs> I've got moments like that where it's like, I had uh, qualms with JCP, for example, right? Because they weren't honest about the fact that they were just importing a light and selling it. But the actual light they're bringing in is a nice light. And I think the product is good. All they had to do is be like, we chose this light because we think it's the best option out there. And by us bringing it in, we can offer it cheaper and faster to people in the United States and Canada than by them trying to get it from China themselves. That's all they had to say. And I'd have been like, perfect. That's a good message. That's a, I believe in this product. Yes, we did not design it. We're just importing it. But we bring in lots of them because we know it's awesome. And we can offer it to people at a great price. That's fine. It's the same thing a lot of businesses do. Tons of them. Tons of them do that. It's called proprietary product. It's like, uh, you know, I used to work in the flooring industry. We did that all the time. We had Chinese manufacturers that made stuff for us. We did some spec work, right? We got it to a special spec just for us. But it's not like we were manufacturing it. China was. But it was our product had our warranty, we brought it in at a rate that we could offer a phenomenal price on it that you couldn't get anywhere else. That's what makes it a proprietary product. Like every every big company does something similar. Hillbilly Aquatics, welcome to Auto Sinkless. Thanks for becoming a member, I appreciate it. Uh, e Lils, I feel like the pump head for the Fritz Complete gets a bit crispy. Oh yeah, I've had total problems. Um, my, my Fritz Complete that's right here if I were to pump it right now, nothing would come out. I have to unscrew it and, and and pump it, and it'll spray it out of the bottom of the intake tube to the same amount, which I find hilarious. <laughs> so I have, like, a, a workaround to use it still when I do my water changes here. <laughs> but it still functions fine. It's just something in the, the arc of the top of the pump head is, like, gunking it up so it won't fix it, and I don't want to take the time to, like, clean it out i found my workaround kelly foreman i just got melanotania running river nice dude when those when you get them to f the adult males to fully color up oh especially you can get a little actual natural sunlight coming in on them oh there's such a cool fish and they they school super tight that's the thing i love the most about mine is they're they are very tight schoolers now, granted, they're a little panicky. Mine are, at least. Hopefully yours aren't. <laughs> Maybe it's I just don't see me enough. I need to be, like, living in my fish room when I work or something. I don't know. But, um, yeah. Uh, E-Littles, I know you have a rare pink crypt name that leads me. Are there any chances you would have some at Triple Crown? I know it's a stretch, but thought I'd ask. Uh, so I'm not going to take any plants to Triple Crown. And, and the only reason why is I'm already shipping a bunch of stuff out to a friend's house to give away as like uh some merch stuff out there so i i won't have room for like taking a bunch of plants with me plus it, plants that far can be a little bit of a stretch my goal is as i get a good understanding and feel for my cadence um i'm gonna try and get to a point of where i can do like a once a month thing where i'll uh sell a certain number of plants out of my tanks and ship them to people. I won't be able to ship fish because it's a lot more work, but shipping plants is a lot easier. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going to start. And I'm going to try to do it like once a week. I I don't know how much I'm going to have, so it might be one of those things that like maybe the first couple of times will be just for the members to kind of say thank you. And for me, I'm like I'm, I sell plants pretty cheap when I sell them. 
like I'm, I'm not charging uh, the plant you're thinking of is Jacobson I pink is the name of the crypt uh, I'll spell it out in chat real fast But, um, yeah, I don't know. I'll f I'm going to figure something out. I need to figure out the full cadence of my work and how I can, like, loop that in upon all the YouTube stuff and, like, you know, trying to take time with my lady, too. But, yeah, uh, my goal is to, to ship some plants. I won't be able to ship fish just because it takes extra work. And I, I just, it's so much easier to ship a plant and know that it's going to arrive live rather than dealing with fish. Uh, and anything that I would do with fish, I would probably do through Jason at Redfish Bluefish or, uh, you know, or, or somebody else if if Jason, like, decides he didn't want to keep working with me or something at some point. I don't know. It depends on him, right? That's all up to him. It's, it's his business. It's up to him. He's just the, the person that I'm working with for now. Do, 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 do. Let me see here. Something, something about uh, Kelly wanted to hold me to my word on something. Uh, it's probably that she's always right. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay, here's a great question from Mark. How do you decide which type of filter to put on a tank? I like this question a lot. So there's, I would say there's two deciding factors for me personally. Number one, uh, do I, do I want to spend the extra cost on a powered filter? And then if I, if the answer to that is yes, then the question is how big is the tank? So, usually, on bigger tanks, something like 75 gallons or more, I tend to like canister filters because they just have enough flow. Or I would need to do multiple hang-on backs. For something like a 40 breeder, I prefer a hang-on back. It's a lot easier to service. Smaller tanks, something that's like 10, 15 gallons, I really just like sponge filters. Now, long term, when I go build my garage out into a fish room, I'm going to air power basically everything but the display tanks. And the display tanks are going to sit on sumps. So that'll tell you where, like, my long term goal is. Sponges on air and sumps. That's it. Right? But in the short term, the way I work now, lots of hang-on back filters, a few canisters here and there, and then now all my smaller tanks, they're just air powered because it's simple and easy. I prefer simplicity wherever possible. But for the fish that need more flow, like something like a Pleco tank, right? I have a 30 breeder that's my breeding colony of wobbin boosters. They need some movement. They have an or they have a uh, Tidal 70 on them. Or I think it's a 75, right? They go by fives, not by uh, whole numbers. It's AquaClear, it's whole numbers. So that just tells you, I have lots of like AquaClear and Tidal 110s on 40 breeders. Because I love that size filter on that size tank. And it might be more flow than I need. But it just works out the way I want it to. Yogurt covered mirror. Uh-oh. <laughs> I would like to update you on my dirt tank adventure. Alright. It's amazingly dense with plants. My golden top minnows are still very timid. But for good reason. Well, how are they, why are they so timid if they got lots of room to hide? No, I mean, if once you get, once you get dirt right... Like, I know I, I, I shame dirt, but that's mostly because I just had a bad experience. And it's mostly because I, me, screwed up, right? When you do dirt right, you can get amazing results with it. But for those of us who like to mess with our plants a lot, there's some risk in doing dirt. Because you can, you can break through your cap, you can cause all sorts of problems. Just There's lots of potential for nightmare. Which is why most of us lazy people just use Aquaswale. Cost more, certainly. But it's easy for us lazy people. Uh, Wayne Talbot. Oh, Bentley, is it possible for plants to become static and stop growing? Nothing is dying and I've changed nothing. Um, so, kind of? So, what I've experienced personally, and I, I don't know a way to get um, like a scientific answer to you. But this is just what I've experienced. I can get plants to kind of an equilibrium place where instead of them focusing on growth, they'll kind of bulk themselves out or create lots of side child plants, like in the case of Java fern, right? But they kind of stay relatively static. The problem is what's really going on is they're growing at a slow pace and we're not really, that, that growth isn't as obvious, but they are still kind of growing. 
You can also get to a point with certain plants where the old growth is getting choked out because it doesn't have enough nutrients to sustain this bigger body. So it's focusing on new growth and letting the old growth die uh, and basically consuming it itself. And it might be in a place where you don't necessarily see it. It depends on the type of plant. Where I see this the most is swords uh, and, and certain types of stems where they'll drop the lower foliage and just keep growing upward. But, yeah, it's certainly possible to get kind of to, a, like, a stalemate, if you will. Uh, I see this the most in things like Valisnerias and Crypts. That's the most common where I see that kind of, like, almost dormant period, if you will, where they just kind of chill and stay where they are static for a while. Stephen P. Wait, who is getting free stuff from Flufall? Impossible. <laughs> yeah, Flufall be true, man. Ah... <laughs> uh, Let's see here. And I hope, Mark, I hope I answered your question there. It, uh, the biggest thing for me usually when it comes to filters is size of tank. That tells me whether I need uh, multiple hang-on backs or a canister. And then sometimes I choose canisters because I'm testing them as opposed to necessarily because that's the, the best option. Uh, and then there, there's, there's, so many, there's so much like personal taste that goes in that stuff. Uh, Stephen Ald, what's in your tank behind you fish-wise, bro? Well, bruh. <laughs> Actually, not very much. Uh, there's two reticulated SAEs and one uh, kind of young, like juvenile, super red bristle nose. I'm actually to a point of where I've kind of just let this tank stay static. I haven't decided if I'm going to put anything new in it uh, because more than likely with some of the stuff in my new work, like I'll be changing kind of this whole area here. Uh, and that might mean taking this out entirely and removing my Fluval Flex. Uh, and if that's the case, then I want—I don't want to add anything new to it because I need to be able to break that down if that's what has to happen. Because basically this is going to become my work office space, uh, even though it's like been my editing bay and streaming center. I'll have some changes that is mostly for work. And then uh, that way I'm not trying to consume like other portions of my house. If that makes sense. So there might be some changes in the future where like this just disappears. Who knows? I kind of want to have a tank in my room because I like having a tank in my room, but it might move where it's no longer in a shot. It might turn into like the a 20 long and I keep over that way again or something. But yeah, not much. And then there's a lot of crips beyond the fish. Lots of crips. Uh, Jacob Hill, is there a light timer that when it shuts off is dimmed instead of instant shut off? I find it spooks my fish. So, that's, that's very hard to do, uh, because usually we're just cutting power. That has to be, the dimming has to usually be built in to the light itself. Now, there are ways that you can, like, cut the power cord and make some alterations to a light to kind of force it to dim with some dimming controllers, but that instantly voids your warranties. So, just keep that in mind. <laughs> Master photographer at Lady Dan, are you the lady to Bentley? No, no, not at all. Uh, occasionally, when you'll see her, her, her YouTube name is The Jossie Experience. That is my lady. Lady Diane is just an awesome viewer. She's been around for a while. Lady, lady Diane, you've been around for quite a bit, haven't you? Oh, you already said goodnight. Maybe you're gone already. Jeez, I'm just babbling it. Nobody. <sighs> nope. Okay, you're still here. Good. I'm not babbling it. Nobody. All intentional. I promise. <laughs> ah, man. All right. Lots of it. I'm gonna check here. Uh, last question. I'll, I'll answer for the night. Is we're getting at the end of times. Jeff Kosky, Bentley was just wondering why I can't get water sprite to survive. I get tons of other plants that are doing awesome, but the water sprite just turns brown. So two things with water sprite. Water sprite tends to not like super bright light. Uh, water sprite, very often, if it's getting too much light, it kind of like sunburns itself. Does that make sense? Two, it likes a lot of nutrients because it's a super fast grower. Uh, so very often what I found when people are struggling with water sprite and this uh, 
Plyosaur Water Wisteria 2, Hygrophila deformis, is that usually it's such a hog for nutrients that you've got the balance right for everything else in the tank, and it's getting not enough for how much it wants to just keep soaking up, especially nitrate. Um, so, like, I keep a lot of my my water sprite in my more fish dense tanks because then there's extra fish poo it's going to create some nitrates because the nitrogen cycle blah 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 and it just does the job for me the other thing i've noticed is that in general that plant in some tanks just never likes to be planted and wants to just be a floating plant and the way you can kind of cheat this is um keeping it in like a planter you can put it in like well as a little aquarium co-op like planter holders and keep it in like the little planted thing that it comes in tends to survive a lot better than being fully in the substrate hope that helps uh indoor fishing inside there's a timer that has six different settings at programmable light percentages uh it might not function with all lights that's the the big thing that i will caution there but it would be interesting to see what lights that does function with without like blowing them to bits because some of them like go crazy some of the, especially if you're more economical lights, they tend to, like, not accept that very well. Sunny saying, how much did I miss? Kind of the whole stream. But that's what the replay's for, right? Replay crew, man. It'll be all right. Just throw me on the background, listen to my crazy butt babble while you're doing some water changes or something. Perfect. There you go. So, yeah, indoor fishing inside using dimmable floodlights. If it's naturally able to handle that, then usually those controllers can do really well. Um, I can't remember. I mean, you've... If you want to post the brand that does it, feel free. But yeah, there you go. There's there's another option. Gang, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. As always, I will see you next Tuesday. We'll have another random topic. It might or may not be philosophical. Who knows? Who knows? But we'll, we'll babble some fish stuff next week. Uh, thank you again to Verily Verily, Master Photographer and Hillbilly Aquatics. Two Super Chats plus a new member. I really appreciate it. I think we actually, like, just hit 100 members, which I might do something special for the members because of that. I don't know. I'll figure that out. We'll talk about it next stream if I make sure. All right? Gang, as always, thank you so much for watching, and stay awesome. See you soon.